So attention dear doctors, I request the attention of all the respected faculties and delegates. Kindly allow me a few minutes of yours and let me introduce myself and introduce the faculty members of this session. Good afternoon and welcome to one and all. I'm Ritu Parna from Clarnet, the designated session assistant for a seamless experience and Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Clarnet is very proud to be digital partner for this event organized by the National Neonatology Forum, Gujarat. Uh, now, without wasting any further minute, let's begin today's session, for which I would like to invite Dr. Prashant Karia, the Honorable Secretary of NNF Gujarat. Over to you, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, Ritupanna. So, on behalf of NNF Gujarat, I, Dr. Prashant Karia, welcome one and all to today's neonatal part shala. I request our President, Dr. Dipen Patel, to welcome one and all and introduce our experts. Thank you. Yeah, can I share the screen? Uh, uh, I request yes, Dr. Yes, sir. Yes, Yes. Ah. Sorry. You, uh, yeah, yeah. I have stopped my screen. Okay, sir. Now I will be sharing my screen. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, on this sixth consecutive focus series, I think Dr. Mohit sir and Kiran sir are involved in this uh, focus sessions. So this is the sixth focus session of Neutral Partsala. I am actually thankful to Dr. Mohit Sani, sir, for organizing this event. I am extremely thankful to Dr. Kiran Mohit, sir, providing his valuable time. I would like to introduce our experts. Dr. Kiran Mohit, sir, is a well-known faculty. Rather, he is an international faculty. He has various certificates to his name from various countries. Currently, he is HOD of Neonatology, BJ Wadia and Navrozi Wadia Hospital, Mumbai. He has vast experience in as a consultant neonatologist from various countries like Qatar, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. He has more than 30 publications, three book chapters and various grants to his name. Sir is interested in neonatal hemodynamics, ECMO, developmental follow-up, HIE, NEC, probiotics, COVID in newborns, and MIST. Sir is a reviewer of various national and international journals. Sir has also worked as a associate editor for General of Neonatology, NNF. Welcome, sir, for this innovative PDA lecture. I also welcome Dr. Mohit Sani, sir. He is a director of academics and NISU of Institute of Child Health, Nirmal Hospital, Surat. He is also a director of NF Eco Academy, Surat India. Sir has worked as an editor in chief of General of Neurology, NNF India. Sir has remained as a president of NNF Gujarat State Chapter for the year 2020 and 21. Sir was a government governing body member of NNF based zone for the year 2017 and 18. Sir, I am also thankful, sir, for because you also worked in COVID task force for government of India. Sir is an editor of well-known books of echocardiography, that is point of care, neural ultrasound and echo, and neural functional echo made easy. I welcome Dr. Kiran Gore and Dr. Mohit Sani, sir, for this innovative lecture. I request uh, Dr. Prasankarya to proceed with the session. So, thank you so much, sir. And without taking much of a time, now I request Dr. Kiran Gore, sir, to proceed with the focus series 6 PDA. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. So first of all, uh, again, uh, thank you, Dipen, thank you, Prashant, and thank you, NNF uh, Gujarat, for uh, inviting me and giving this opportunity to speak on this platform. And also special thanks to Dr. Mohit uh, for you know involving in this series and uh, also uh, involve me in his, his ongoing uh, program uh, with NEPCO. So we are also conducting the training program, but he's uh, involved me in. Uh, uh, participating in this focus series also. So today's talk is on PDA and uh, his plan was to do it in two sessions. So I'm going to talk about the principles or everything related to PDA, but echo. So I'll not be spending much time on echo, echo views, hemodynamic assessment, but all the principles related to the echo uh, PDA we will be talk I will be talking. So uh, I have nothing to disclose, but just uh, displaying uh, the uh, Wadia Hospital, where I'm currently working, is alma mater for a lot of us uh, uh, who have done pediatric training in uh, uh, in Mumbai. And at the bottom, this is the MRR Children Hospital, where I'll be joining uh, as a head of the NICU soon. So, uh, 
uh, this is the slide I often use in a lot of talks because you know it makes sense and sets the ball rolling that in last 40, 50 years in neurology as the advancement are happening, a lot of evidence is getting published and meta-analysis and uh, studies are getting published. And if you just search PDA on PubMed, <laughs> it will hit about 1300 searches and about more than 72 or 80 different types of RCTs <laughs> have been published. And still, despite this, when we say about PDA, everyone seems to be very confused and uh, everyone seems to do different things. Uh, so, and also, but what has happened with the advancement uh, is the art of neonatology or art of uh, clinical medicine, art of physiology is going down. So we need to understand that we are clinicians and physicians and uh, whatever we do, we have to have a physiological understanding to apply uh, uh, the, that knowledge for the clinical decision making. So that art is, seems to be going and I, and all the hemodynamic lectures we talk about that, you need to understand the physiology and take decision based on that. There is no standard guideline or protocol that ABCD, uh, this equal to this, uh, but you have to tailor made uh, uh, the management for an MD individual, uh, individual. So more our understanding is then whatever evidence says doesn't matter. We can decide upon that baby. And with uh, technology, now we get uh, uh, not only echo, but a lot of other information and the poor clinician get confused. So let me see today in my next 40, 30, 40 minutes, uh, almost 45 minutes, I think I'll spend uh, slowly. I'll take you through different aspects of the PDA uh, management principles. So to be or not to be or treat or not treat is a big dilemma in PDA. And that's why PDA is called as a peak conundrum. You know, and uh, the more I think, the more I get confused. Conundrum means a puzzle. And uh, I think it was very easy when I was a resident or uh, doing my fellowship that whenever a cardiologist to tell us that PDA is present, we used to start treatment. I thought it was a no-brainer. And now the more I know about it, the more I get confused and more I get uh, conscious about treating for the various reason. And this, uh, this conundrum has got completely shifted. So, uh, so we like to, you know, uh, discuss this uh, conundrum based on this following uh, sections, which will be the overview of the talk. And this is what we have covered in uh, one of the book chapters uh, we have published with Dr. Uh, Professor Samir Gupta. And uh, it, it's available online to read uh, everything uh, about this. So what is a PDA? Why we need to treat? When do we need to treat? And how to treat? Uh, so historically, as I was saying, so in the residency, it was easy, you know, everyone in the uh, past believed that PDA is a problem because a lot of uh, simple observational studies and RCTs showed that the longer the PDA remains open, longer, more are the problems. So there is a, and earlier the PDA closed, there is reduction in the necrotizing enterocolitis. So neck mortality was lower in the babies who were PDA was closed earlier. And in fact, uh, there was there were RCTs comparing prophylactic ligation. So you will laugh now if you say that, okay, we are considering prophylactic ligation in first three days. You know, you will laugh at it. But it's been published that people have been considering PDA such a big problem that they were even considering ligating every baby. But in those studies also, it has shown that NEC was lower, morbidity was lower in the babies who were ligated. So definitely... To an extent, PDA has been contributing to all this morbidity. So everyone was con convinced about that. And uh, if you look at the Sharp Nuri's paper, uh, which is an observation study, but it's a very good paper to show that on day three of life, presence of just pres mere presence of a large PDA in a baby who's less than 28 weeks is associated with threefold increase in the odds of death or severe morbidity. Almost four times odds of increasing IVH and increased chance of BPD, NEC and eightfold rise of mortality. Now, this is an association, but we cannot ignore such association, you know. So, definitely to some extent, persistence of PDO beyond three days is contributing to uh, some problem. This has been perceived by the people, most of the clinicians across the globe especially in the hemodynamic community, you know, like 10, 12 years, I've been doing echoes and training echoes. And most of us have believed that PDA is a problem and we have to address it early. The earlier you address it, maybe better it is. But then why, what has happened in last five to 10 years? Uh, 
there are different uh, 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 group of clinicians who are believing that maybe we are talking too much about PDA. PDA is not a big problem. It's just a big problem. You know, it's just a big problem. It's just a big problem. It's not a big problem. Or none of the studies are showing uh, PDA treat karo to bhi paida hota hai, nahi karo to bhi paida hota hai. So, you know, people are doubting this and there's a big, uh, especially in US and uh, North America and also some of the places in Europe, uh, people are moving towards saying that, hey doc, please leave the PDA alone. You don't have to worry about it. Jab, whenever you feel there's a problem or you hear a murmur, you treat it. And people are following a cohort uh, and then everyone else are following that, okay, PDA is probably not a problem as it is being perceived. And people are starting to believe something called as therapeutic nihilism, which is um, means masterly inactivity. People want to do masterly inactivity for PDA and, um, you know, like uh, uh, don't treat it and don't look, look for it uh, unless it is giving the problem. So people are trying to move away from doing echoes or, you know, uh, only when you detect, then try treating it for it. So why happen? And there are three, four reasons for it. So before going onward, I'll quickly go through that, uh, why this shift has happened. So from we are completely gone from aggressive uh, management up to very much conservative, but whether there are pros and cons for both and probably we need to be somewhere in the middle. And uh, that is what I'll try to address in today's talk. So what is the natural history of PDA? So uh, the controversy exists between how, what is actually the definition of PDM is when do you call the doctors as patent? or persistently patent doctors addresses. So beyond what day you will say ki baba PDA hai because we know in fetal life doctors is there and then it should close but in preterm it will take longer time to close. So how long we should wait before we call that this is a problematic PDA. So for that we need to know the natural history of the PDA. So in term babies it closes very rapidly. So it's no brainer uh, in almost 50% in within 12 hours. And 96% within 30 to 40 hours. So by second, third day, doctors in a term maybe should be closing, closed. If it's not closing, then probably it's a problem. There is some issue. And if you go in uh, late preterm and preterm, so the closure is inversely proportional to the gestation. Inversely proportional to the gestation. Uh, so in an extreme premie, less than 26 weeker, it can remain open as long as 71 days in median and between 26 to 20, maybe one to two weeks and more than 30 weeks by day five, day six, it will close. So then that tells us that probably PD is not a problem for babies who are more than 30 weeks. So again, what all this discussion we are talking is for the babies who are less than 30 weeks because more than 30 weeks, the doctors close and uh, uh, again, if it's baby is 32, 33, 34 weaker, it will probably close by day two, day three, day four. So that's why median time is around day two or day three, beyond which if the doctor is present, then only probably will create problem. But I would not ask you to or recommend you to suggest screening for the doctors uh, for babies more than 30 weeks. So in more than 30 weeks, don't worry because it will automatically close. Okay. And Less than 28 weeker also, the baby doctors will close uh, in 50% of the time. But as we saw here, it might remain open for a very long period of time. And the longer it remains open, the, the exposure of the shunt, the volume of the shunt, uh, the baby will get exposed to, that might create the problem. Okay, and that is what we need to target that we need to identify which babies it will remain open and which babies it will not. I'll just take a one minute break. I'll get off from the car and I'll uh, start from the desk. Just hold on for a minute. Yeah, for the time being, till Dr. Kiran has been shifting his desk. So uh, this is very aptly he has told that your PDA is now majorly all over the world is a problem for ELBWs, there for babies more than 30 weeks or in terms, there are one in, you know, few cases, one in thousands. There are very few cases now which are outlier that can be a problematic. 
like we have seen babies who are 2 kg 2.1 kg 2.2 uh, 2 kg and the duct is very large and it may become hemodynamic insignificant but that is something very rare it is not very commonly that happens so in elws this is a major problem and now the world has shifted from at least from ligation to no ligation and then so uh, when i was doing a training in uh, sick kids we used to get uh, babies at least we used to do two ligations one to two ligations a week but in india since i am here in last 10 years we have ligated only three or four babies in last 10 years so one it depends on the referral unit also but the, that trend has gone down the prophylactic closure of the pd has gone down so rest of the things dr kiran will be discussing also so the things have changed quite a bit over the years as as he showed in his slide so he has rejoined again i think so so dr kiran are you there ah yes okay sorry shift of perfect so as as dr mohit rightly said this is the the shift is uh, over period people have now going down uh, they are not looking for pds much more so diagnosis of pd is going down use of uh, the nsaids is going down pd ligation is going down and uh, during this period the mortality is also improved uh, so whether it is because we're not addressing pd but it is also that as the developed motor so is improved but there are observation studies couple of studies which again has uh, made this uh, change uh this epic study for 7000 babies also they they found that the babies who were sicker they have pda which was open and they were treated they were at the risk of bpd and death so again chicken and egg is difficult to this thing is the pda which is a problem and that is a pda tolerant trial so they said they thought maybe you know let's put on with the pda let's not treat it and let's see what happens so they are actually in primary result they they showed no difference even if you do conservative approach but in a lot of babies uh, where the clinicians opted out for uh, not treating conservatively and if you look at these babies where in the pda tolerate where they were not treated uh, so, so that cohort was actually smaller co- so they were smaller that it but uh, so and they actively treated these babies with open label treatment and these babies actually found to have lower vpd and composite vpd and death so maybe you know as dr mohit was saying extreme premi or elbw is a particular population which needs to be addressed and in that also probably we need to identify based on the echo where really the baby is hemodynamically significant then only we treat okay and, and uh, uh other the ductal patency that goes down uh, uh, Hello, sir. Doctor Kiran Mohan, sir. Am I audible to you? At least for his, uh, this thing has let uh, let let is an issue for him. I think so. Yes, sir. I also feel the same that he is having some network issues, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll just call him. Let's see. Ah, uh, let me see. 
we call him. Hello, Kiran, are you able to listen? Yeah, yeah, I think there was some, suddenly the virus yes. was lost. I'm back now, sorry. Uh, I think I'm in the hospital with a good Wi-Fi, but the Wi-Fi was lost. So I hope I'm audible now. Yes. It is, it is in between, it is breaking. I think so. The Wi Fi, right? One should be staying away from ligation. And Hello, Kira. Hello, Kiran. I've shifted to phone. I think the Wi-Fi is unstable. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is what this is better. This is better, I think. All right. So, uh, and then uh, you know. No, like uh, there were two big trials uh, which were expected that they will give us some enlightenment and highlight about uh, you know what should be the guidance. Like one was the baby Oscar trial, which was done uh, one of my previous colleague, Professor Samir Grapta. It was done across UK and a very good, well conducted trial, but they failed to uh, show any positive benefits of treating the doctors early within 72 hours. Similarly, Benedictus trial also failed to show. There was a, that was done in the various centers in Europe, failed to show much more benefits about treating the doctors, but, and, and so is the other few trials. But again, why the trials were not able to answer? And if you dig into that, that there was already a bias in the patient selection. This trial had older babies, you know, so they, as I was trying to highlight, and that, that is why I spent so much time in explaining this, that in the trials, if you have babies more than 30 weekers uh, in both the groups, uh, then there will be a bias because a lot of these babies naturally also the ductus will uh, close. So I think the trials needed babies less than 28 or less than 20, 30 weeks only. And that there was a big bias. Also, the echo criteria were very, very uh, vague, only just ductal diameter and LAO. So you're not really selecting the babies which will qualify for hemodynamically significant PDA based on echo, which Dr. Mohit will talk next time. Also, nobody paid attention on shunt volumes. You know, what is the organ damage? Is there a ductal steel? How much is the volume of the shunt? That is also was not considered. What is the respiratory status of the baby was not considered. So, you know, baby who, who's got ductus, suppose 1.5 or 2 millimeter, who is on a ventilator versus baby who's on CPAP. There's a difference because um, uh, once baby is stable, we perceive that it's not causing much problem. So we can wait in such babies. We don't have to address that. So that issue, none of the trials have addressed. 
and uh, again uh, no much uh, emphasis about physiological understandings and mechanisms also heterogeneous group and the last but not important is the open label treatment was which very high so a lot of important babies were opted out so you were not able to address the real question because a lot of clinicians opted out for certain babies because there is still inclination about treating so uh, we are stuck at a still same position so that comes to the time what is the pda as i was saying naturally all will close uh, and it is not about pda present or absent i think we have to get away from that the pda hai ki nahi hai cardiologists also comes and say pda 2 mm and that's what they write and they go and we start treatment so it is not a dichotomous center it's not yes or no is it present or not present we have to see if pda has got some benefits if there is a ductal dependent lesion or there is a pphn the pda might be beneficial or pda is present but it's a bystander so it's not it's a innocent bystander it's not causing any problem so why you want to treat and address and chase the ductus you have to identify the baby where it is harmful so this is the only cohort which you need to find out and echo will help you in that and if you look at the pda physiology so we know in fetal life ductus is present which is essential but and uh, pulmonary pressures are very elevated the moment baby is delivered pulmonary pressures will drop and drop gradually and the ductus uh, which is completely right to left in utero will become left to right ductus and uh, as it becomes more left to right as the pulmonary pressures are dropping you will start having the diastolic hypotension so you will see the diastolic dropping and baby will get hypotension now whether you treat that hypotension is a whole different different topic but if it's symptomatic causing acidosis then probably yes but if it's just diastolic hypotension probably you can watch for some time because baby is transitioning ductus is open sometime hypotension will be there and if the ductus closes the hypotension will improve now if the ductus remains open by day 2 day 3 the ductus shunt might increase a little bit and uh, it remains left to right it might flood the lungs and may cause pulmonary hemorrhage and if it persists beyond there's an almost risk of ivh and all these risks happen in first 7 days of life and uh, beyond that if it still persist so beyond that either it will go down or it will remain open and that and how much blood is flooding to the lungs determine if there is a bpd developing or not okay and uh, again uh, when you understand pda physiology you need to understand shunt physiology in the babies because it's not straight forward as pediatric or uh, or uh, adult population where left side out output is different than the right side output everything is mixed here because there is there are two shunts playing in between so you need to know that whenever you are looking at the heart and looking at the echoes we need to know that systemic blood flow which is returning the blood from the systemic body uh, like upper and lower body coming to the right side of the heart should determine your right ventricular output but the pfo patent foramen ovale is playing a role as well so if the pfo is big you will have more blood coming to the left right side of the heart and that's why your right ventricular output might go up because of that so right ventricular output is determined by systemic blood flow and atrial shunt and similarly in pda uh, uh, the left side the majority of the blood coming to the left side of the heart is from the pulmonary veins coming to the left side of the atrium so la and that goes to the lv but because there is a pda the pda will shunt away a lot of blood and that will again go to the lungs and flood the lungs and again will have a more blood coming to the left side of the heart and that's why the la keeps increasing la keeps increasing the lv keeps increasing and this this uh, shunt uh, keeps happening till the pd is open and the heart becomes dilated la lv becomes dilated and that's why your lvo is uh, contributed by pulmonary blood flow but also the degree of ductal shunt and longer this pd remains open more of this recirculation is happening which is affecting the lungs and affecting the heart and maybe affecting the systemic circulation okay so that's why um, that's why when we want to interpret what's going on rvo often tells you more about systemic blood flow not the pulmonary which um, we we might think because rvo will tell you what is the blood going reaching the uh, systemic circulation and similarly 
your LVO measurements will tell you about the pulmonary over circulation. So if you do left ventricular output, if, if it is increasing more and more, that means your PDA is shunting more and more. Okay. So again, uh, all of us know effects of shunt may be broadly classified into two things which causes systemic hypoperfusion and because of the, uh, the effect of the pulmonary over circulation. So two effects are happening. So because of the PDA, PDA causes a lot of shunting away from the various organ, such as uh, if your uh, uh, blood flow to the uh, gut is affected, then you have ductal steel. Uh, first is importantly, is your cerebral blood flow affected, then you have a IVH of poor perfusion or sometimes reperfusion injury. In gut blood flow is affected, you get PDA intolerance or neck. And systemic blood flow getting affected causes metabolic acidosis, lactic acidosis. So these are the effects because of the systemic hypoperfusion. And other side, because of the overcirculation, we saw how it will overcirculate the lungs in the blood, blood in the lungs, it will cause increased pulmonary blood flow. So more oxygen will be required, more ventilatory support will be required, pulmonary hemorrhage can occur, cardiac dilatation can occur, CCF, need of diuretics will happen. So this I think all of us are aware. So we know these are aware, but what happens? We find the babies when the complication happens, you know, we don't know what's going on. Suddenly baby gets bleeding. Suddenly baby gets NEC, you know, uh, and then uh, sometime progressively they get CCF. So we have to learn to identify which babies might get into trouble. And for that, we need to follow this baby serially based on echo and clinically. And there, were, there are a lot of clues on the echo, which will tell you how you can identify that. And again, more on that, uh, we will speak in the next uh, session when Dr. Mohit will cover. So increasing volume of the shunt will increase all the effects. So longer the duration of the shunt, more the volume of the shunt, all these effects will be pronounced. And none of nobody has addressed this in any of the trials, which is something needs to be considered. But this is something we know already when we do the echo bedside. So, uh, so utility of echo something now I will skip uh, as part of the uh, this thing, but broadly, whenever you do, you have to rule out the heart disease and then assess if the echo uh, PDA is hemodynamically significant or not, assess the shunt volume, and then sometime you need echo later on to see whether it is suitable for doing a ligation or device closure. So these are the different indication for which echo is done. And uh, so I will skip the measurements of the 2D and all those things. We will see how we will do that. But just a couple of scenarios I will talk. And this is a typical scenario you will face uh, in, the, in your unit that uh, a baby, a 26 or 27 weeker baby is there, 800 grammar and ventilated. On day of life, first 35% oxygen. You're given surfactant, baby is improving. And then you have a this kind of a duct. And uh, this kind of a pattern. So anyone want to put it in the chat box? Uh, you should, do you think we should treat these doctors or should we wait or should we not do anything? Any comments on this? Ah, no, no. So anyone? wants to put it in the chat box so no treatment bidirectional left to right is more yes should wait 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 perfect so some see clinical features and wait perfect so i think all of us are on the same thing so you know now if a cardiologist is writing pda present and uh, significant i would still suggest to wait for a couple of reasons it's too early for probably and there's a bit of a bidirectional shunt going on this baby is probably transition there is only this is called as a growing pattern this baby is in transition circulation. So although this is left to right majority, this baby is transitioning. So you need to give some time for this baby to treat, to see how he evolves. Don't jump to treat such babies. Now, same baby, day three or day four of life, baby's FI2 requirement went up to 65%. Now the ductus is more bigger. Cardiologist comes and write an echo. Ductus is larger and this is the pattern. Will you treat? Can you please type again? Will you treat at this stage? Day four treat. Sridhar is saying day four treat. Because it's day four, it's persisting beyond day three. So Sridhar is saying treat. Anyone else? Please type quickly. Treat. So treat. 
A O ratio. A O ratio is still 1.5, 1.6 uh, as to so not much uh, chamber enlargement, but P D is very large. Yes, it indicates P H right to left is more. Treat if it is completely right to left. Okay, treat, treat, no treatment. Mehul, uh, would you like to uh, unmute and just tell me why you don't want to treat? I can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking that it was more of right to left. Correct. You are right. It's more of right to left. So this is the right to left. So this is one cycle. This is more of right to left. So why you don't want to treat right to left ductus? Uh, right to left, uh, yeah, basically it is uh, relieving the uh, pulmonary hypertension. That's, uh... Correct. Absolutely right. So I think that's what I would not treat this. This is why again I, I, I got this uh, scenario that often, you know, cardiologist or will write it up and you will just see that ductus is present and it is bigger and you will want to treat. But this is a more bidirectional shunt. The baby has got worsen because the pulmonary pressures have gone up. And this is where the ductus is beneficial. It's not causing any harm. But if you close this ductus, you might get into trouble. So you should not treat. Even it is day four, you should not treat this ductus. You will you will first address the pulmonary hypertension, maybe optimize the this thing. You add pulmonary vasodilator, but you don't treat this ductus. Now this baby on day five, day six, this is the rectal pattern. I think the video is not playing. But this is the rectal pattern. And again, more of this in the next echo class. But this is just to highlight about decision making. Now, same baby, or uh, now FIO2 has come down. And this is the ductus. About 3 millimeter ductus is there, 2.8 millimeter ductus. And this is the pattern. Will you treat? Yeah, quickly chat, quickly write in the chat box. Yes. treatment yes so now this is the time where i think the, here the pulmonary pressures have resolved the ductus is now still big and there's a pattern called as pulsatile pattern which is not restricted again more different types of patterns we'll talk in the next treatment class but this is the pattern probably you need to treat so it's not only the presence of ductus i just wanted to highlight this that it's a type of ductus pattern the timing what respiratory settings baby is on uh, you know, uh, and identify the physiology, whether it's ductus is beneficial or not. These are all things we have to think before treating. So same baby in a different stage of life, PDA might be uh, like a innocent bystander, might be beneficial and then become harmful. So in the three patterns, this is how the PDA has evolved. And now we can say, well, now if I don't close, this maybe might get a pulmonary hemorrhage or we might get a ductus steal or all those things. Okay. So these are different patterns. Again, more details to follow different patterns and pulsatile is one which need to treat it. And there are various echo parameters where you can look at uh, the shunt volumes and determine pulmonary flooding or determine uh, uh, how much is the shunt volume and determine if there is a systemic steel. So there are echo parameters for that, doing celiac, SMA, MCS, Dopplers and all. And there are various uh, uh, echo parameters which will tell you whether ductus is significant or not. And please follow in the next class about going into detail about each and every parameters when Dr. Mohit will be showing you how exactly you identified and how do you classify. So I'll not spend much more time because today's focus is just talking about principles. Okay. Now, uh, sometimes suppose you don't have an echo available or you've done the echo, you want to follow can biomarkers help? Well, something that is evolving, uh, a lot of studies are done. Uh, and one of the things you're promising is probably NTP, bro, BNP done in the plasma might have some sort of uh, correlation with the presence of ductus. There are lots of studies done. We also had published one study uh, observation for 50 babies. And uh, so there are various cutoffs are there. And suppose BNP is enlarged, elevated that particular cutoff, then it might indicate that there is probably LA dilatation because BNP is a, a marker comes from the uh, atrial dilatation. So if the PD is significant and the atriars are dilating, then probably BNP might go up. So, uh, so there are uh, so it can indirectly suggest that ductus might be significant. But the problem is various labs give different different cutoffs and different assays are used for BNP. So there is no standard cutoff which can be followed. 
like in our essay it was more than 1100 uh, number bnp is there these doctors tend to remain open for more than 10 days so but uh, you know if you have availability something this can and something to be explored in future now this uh, another important slide about timing and uh, before we sum up on the management principles so what is the timing so when should we screen and treat this is a big question everyone asks ki echo cup kare cup screen karna chahiye and uh, you know different again uh, different uh, if you look at uh, australian aspects of so i was trained in australia i used to do echo first 12 hours or 24 hours and then we used to follow up within 48 hours uh, canadian approach is slightly but 48 to 72 hours same is the european approach and uh, so there are plus and minus about uh, looking or screening for the PDA uh, at various time points. So suppose you want to um, uh, screen early within 12 hours. So that was also an approach done uh, in between two year 2000 to 2010, the TIP trial and where, you know, uh, early trials where prophylactic endomethacin was given. So the idea was if you reduce the ductus early, you will get benefits of closure of the ductus importantly ivh which a lot of people were worried about so if you give prophylaxis so you look at the first line in a, if you treat if you screen and treat in first 12 hours if the pda is present you start treatment your closure rate will be higher and probably you get benefits of reduction of the ivh and pulmonary hemorrhage also and also reduction in the ligation but the problem is you will end up treating a lot of babies which don't need treatment so, and you will expose these babies for side effects and uh, previously indomethacin, even ibuprofen tend to have some renal side effect, especially in smaller babies. Now, paracetamol is perceived severe, we'll come to that, but you don't want to treat unnecessary. So, this approach has become little less. Next approach is pre-symptomatic. So, we do echo and generally recommended is between 48 to 72 hours. You screen and then you decide what you want to treat or not. And uh, sometime on the first echo, you may not need to decide to treat. You can follow up in a day. But if you treat within 72 hours, pre-symptomatic. So baby doesn't have any uh, significant murmur or bonding pulses. But maybe subtle, subtle signs are there like increased oxygen requirement. Baby might be still ventilated. So in that, if you treat them within first 72 hours, you will still achieve a good closure. And you will get benefits of reduction in the IVH and pulmonary hemorrhage. A lot of these babies, you are now thinking to extubate or not. So I would like to know uh, before extubating whether there's a big ductus sitting because baby to 21% may have ductus. Mein. The moment I extubate and then baby get bled and again got reintubated and uh, going to white out. And all of you must have faced this, you know, so achha achha bolte, parent ko bata de, aaj machine se nikala hai, baby is doing well, or sham ko usko bleed ho jata hai, lungs get white out. And then he again go into high this thing and then families get dicey. And that's where, you know, we don't know where you're sitting on a big ductus because when you extubate these babies, suddenly the pulmonary flooding will happen and the hemorrhage might happen. So you need to watch these babies with an echo, maybe before extubation, whether uh, you need to address that ductus. So maybe you delay extubation if you're really sitting on a big ductus you want to treat. So reduction of IVH, pulmonary hemorrhage, reduction and ligation, but unnecessary treatment is less with this approach. And the other approach is early symptomatic. So by day five, day six, day seven, baby starts to have bounding pulses, big murmur, and the LAO looks dilated. There also you achieve closure, but the problem is you might miss out uh, on benefit from prevention of IVH and uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. These babies might bleed on day four, day five, day six. So you are sitting again on the fence where you might get into trouble. But this approach also ligation is reduced and unnecessary treatment is prevented. So I think, again, a lot of us are still following this approach. And with coming of paracetamol, it seems very perceived. Like you have a look, screen for the PDA, if it's positive, present and significant, then treat with paracetamol is what approach is coming. Now, late symptomatic, very late if you treat, no benefits. And uh, if you do, don't do any treatment, no benefits at all, but it might cause harm, increase risk of neck, death, mortality, all can go up. So conservative approach, definitely not very much encouraged. Now, considering the management, how do you manage these babies? So when you first time see the echo, uh, first time see the baby uh, PD on an echo significant, and if you don't want to treat, suppose you're not sure, 
you can still do something called the expected management. You can wait and if you choose that, okay, BB looks stable to me. I don't want to start treatment. Then you can still utilize strategies to decrease shunt volume, such as increasing PWP. Thoda CPAP 5 to 6 kar lo. PWP 6 ka 7 kar lo. Allow permissible hypercapnia. Don't let these babies overventilate. Allow CO2 is 50, 60 because CO2 is kind of a vasoconstrictor, pulmonary vasoconstrictor. Careful fluid management. What does that mean? Uh, you don't have to fluid restrict early. Uh, what you can do is, but you don't give too much fluid. So if you have incubators available or you can create like a humidity environment uh, in the extreme premise so that the insensible losses are less, then you can be careful in not increasing the fluids too much because sometimes these babies go up to 180, 200 and then the doctors might just get significant or baby might be over volume loaded. So you don't have to unnecessarily restrict in first week uh, but um, you don't have to give too much fluid. So judicious fluid rest, uh, use. Also diuretics probably in first week of life probably is not required. That is when the CCF sets in, that is the time you uh, 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 do this. So uh, basically conservative fluid management is something you do. And restricting specifically like going to 145 to 100 or 120 is definitely not strongly encouraged nowadays, uh, in for, especially in first two, three days of one week because these babies need fluid. And they're already sometimes have compromised systemic uh, perfusion. So if you restrict the fluid, you might compromise systemic perfusion more. So all this fluid restriction, you know, all this traditionally has been ingrained with us. PDA matlab fluid kam karo, lasik chalu karo. This all has been for later, second week, third week, when there is a CCF or signs of failures are there. That is the time, not in first week. So first week, normal rakho, badao mat jada, like in normal rakho. And so there's no evidence also to support fluid restriction routinely. So use good humidification and cautious fluid management. Now, fluzomide, um, uh, fluzomide benefits are harm. So uh, uh, in presence of endomethacin, ibuprofen, sometimes you have increased chance of acute renal failure. But routine diuretics is probably not recommended in first week of life. Only late PDAs. Where there's a cardiomegaly, babies in CCF, you use fruzomide and other diuretics, not early. Caffeine, caffeine is good, is useful for PDA. Caffeine is good for everything. So caffeine tend to reduce PDA. So you can use caffeine, which you, anyway, routinely we are using for all the LBWs. Then which drug to use? So this is the me different mechanisms, uh, you know, your corticosteroid pathway and various drugs acts on different, different um, uh, basically uh, prostaglandin pathway. So your endomethacin and ibuprofen acts on a uh, COX-2. So they are COX-2 inhibitor. So they, uh, they decrease the production of PGG-2. And we know prostaglandins are required for ductal patency, right? We use prostins for ductal patency. So to prevent ductal, uh, for ductal closure, you go use prostamine uh, synthesis inhibitor. So COX-2 inhibitors, endomethacin, ibuprofen, and paracetamol additionally has a peroxidase uh, action on the peroxidase inhibition and again, reduction of the prostaglandins. And also, if you look at steroids and fruzomide also have got some action uh, in, this, um, in this pathway. And also some benefits shown with antenatal endomethacin. So whatever you are giving to the mother or baby, everything has got some effect on the PDA. Now, none of the drugs are safe. And that's why we said we are talking so much that okay don't perceive that whatever you do and maybe paracetamol is very uh, definitely uh, paracetamol is safe but definitely indomethacin had higher side effects so you know there was a reduction in cerebral blood flow with indomethacin the platelet dysfunction was there with indomethacin with some maybe with ibuprofen and uh, renal toxicity was more with indomethacin also fluid retention hyponatremia all these things are common with the cox2 inhibitor but with most of the trials ibuprofen has better safety profile compared to uh, indomethacin and uh, that's why it is coming like a preferred drug more and so and he but hepatotoxicity is more common in acetaminophen and also chances of hyperbilirubinemia so paracetamol also is not completely safe because we're using high dose in a baby who is very premature the liver is immature you might get some hepatotoxicity also so don't think it's completely benign and also Previously, we used to see a lot of intestinal perforation with endomethacin and we again chicken and egg there, whether PDA is causing it or endomethacin, we didn't know. So we have to treat based on risk and benefits of NSAIDs. So we don't want to give any side effects. So select the population which really treat. Don't be desperate to treat uh, and close and follow an in-between approach. 
and the evidence again it that's a whole different talk but this uh, this network meta analysis from mitra et al is something we all talk about all the time because one of the very well done meta analysis and although this table looks complicated but just identify whatever is green is beneficial so green so for pda closure the beneficial and the most beneficial was endo ibuprofen in a high oral dose followed by ibuprofen in the iv dose so these two medications have shown most more beneficial than any other medicines like paracetamol or endomethacin so if you want to choose one drug probably it is oral ibuprofen which will be preferred but problem is a uh, lot of time the baby needs to be on some feeds before you start that and the option is in iv endomethacin but iv iv ibuprofen is not available in india so we struggle there and that's where the the third option comes is paracetamol which is either oral or iv both are available in india so if you look at the evidence ibuprofen is as equally efficacious as endomethacin with less side effect profile and oral administration is as effective as iv so one drug again i will say is probably oral or iv ibuprofen which is the kind of drug of choice but paracetamol is coming up and i don't know why suddenly the everyone has adapted for paracetamol as routinely because uh, still if you look at the uh, evidence it's still not very strongly supporting paracetamol but the trials have so shown that there is no difference between paracetamol and ibuprofen and uh, maybe prophylactic or early paracetamol might be beneficial than placebo this is what the cochrane says but if you look at the cochrane's individually and most recent trial where you know they looked at the smaller babies especially the preterm and elpws look at the denny and davidson trial there the uh, favor is for ibuprofen and not paracetamol so if you look at this clear clearly ibuprofen is beneficial than the paracetamol same in davidson trial ibuprofen is clearly beneficial than this thing but uh, meta analysis is crossing the midline so it's showing no difference but no difference means we are not able to conclude so again probably paracetamol needs to be more trial so if you want to choose one drug and you want to definitely close i would strongly suggest you go for ibuprofen but if you want to be safer and you don't want to be we are not very sure you want to treat then paracetamol might be the drug so this is one approach proposed approach for indian scenarios we published in uh, this new new clips new little handbook of clinical practices this book chapter i wrote and in that we created this kind of algorithm which is suitable for most of you in the indian scenario so, uh, so you do an uh, screening echo if the doctor sees hematin is significant previously try some conservative management as we said increase peep high co2 conservative fluid management all those things but if if it's persistent in a follow up echo maybe choose iv paracetamol it's available in india if baby is on feeds already and baby you are day 4 day 5 you can give even oral paracetamol give for 3 days and follow for the way the echo if there is no a uh, benefit like bactas is still present then maybe go for 3 days course more so maybe totally go for 6 days maximum but watch for uh, liver enzymes monitoring and all those things and uh, withhold if there is a elevation uh, of something happening but suppose if bactas is present and through two doses of paracetamol so 6 days is already over and you think that bactas is really significant causing problem there's a ductal steel then you want to close it probably then you should switch to ibuprofen no point in giving like 10 days paracetamol or extended paracetamol because you will get chance of increased toxicity so then you can go from ibuprofen iv if not available maybe oral by that time already the baby is on oral uh, feed some amount of feeds and you can follow 10 5 5 approach and uh, and then if you are really desperate you can do two courses of 3 days each and um, try to follow up with an echo every 3 days but beyond that if it's persistent like you've done two courses of two different these things then that there's no point in giving any further you have to probably watch and wait for this baby and maybe refer for device closure or surgical ligation beyond second third week of life and uh, for deciding about the ligation again dr mohit will talk more in detail about this uh, what are the echo criteria how do you decide but this is something we publish uh, again uh, there is a triaging process again dr mohit also was there uh, in canada and sick kids we had this triaging process so we we look at we used to categorize patient based on the clinical condition whether they are ventilated they are on high oxygen settings and what the other clinical parameters and then look at the hemodynamic significant and specific echo parameters and then decide about 
whether this brave is treating uh, uh, needing ligation or not. And there also in that cohort, we tried some late paracetamol where some of the babies got benefited and paracetamol worked and we prevented the ligation. So this is more about this discussion in the next talk. And a newer trend is again, uh, uh, that, that this device closure might be the game changer because it is perceived safer and um, not exactly safer, but uh, less invasive because you're just doing a catheterization, you're not doing an open chest or something. And in a good expert's hands, in a good size, maybe in a good center, probably the results are better. So you basically go transfumeral and uh, there are different, different types of devices which are available. And uh, you can just get the PDA out of the equation uh, within even two weeks. So there are there's a trend towards doing early device closure in second week or third week because you don't want a significant BPD to develop. So this might be the game changer. More trials needs to come in before we can say that routinely you can consider this in the second week on the medical therapy phase. But in our previous center also, we were nine or 10 babies by the time I was there. We had done PDA like uh, device closures, but they are again not very completely safe. We had incidents of device slipping into the pulmonary artery or into the aorta. We had a, a thrombosis or uh, ischemia of the limb because of the femur because of the uh, uh, femoral uh, manipulation so it's not completely safe you know hemorrhage can happen babies can get sick sepsis can happen and all those things and there are various surgical approaches percutaneous versus transcatheter occlusion and this a piccolo is a very common device which is um, uh, commonly used but there is like this amplitazar and uh, uh, ocutec all these different different devices are there and you can read about that so maybe the cardiologist can talk more about this but uh, that's approach something is in between we can do so with with this um, i'll just last uh, two minutes um, so future how do you again address you know so i've explained you the physiological understanding and all those things but suppose we want to really conduct a trial in india or uh, you know where we should actually in large multi center trial we should conduct and maybe you should tell uh, guide on how exactly we should address the pda so this trial should have a good patient selection so not only looking at diameter or only LAO, these are the two criteria in every uh, trial, but, but this is probably not enough. We need to look at the shunt volume and signs of end organ injury and maybe target lower gestation babies only, only less than 28 or less than 30 weeks who are at higher risk of CLD and who are maybe at choreo and all those things, you know, and uh, look at all the comprehensive parameters and then only randomize them. And the timing of intervention is very important, probably early not too early so because you don't want to treat on day one but not too late also because there will be irreversible damage so probably day two to day four or something will be this thing and the target should be to ensure closure there shouldn't be any open label treatment allowed you know so clinicians should be very strictly said okay nahi karna hai to nahi karna hai treat. and intention should be to ensure closure so uh so adequate dosing maybe ideal drug like maybe ibuprofen ensure drug delivery so that you intended to close the ductus. So you have to compare babies with ductus closed versus ductus not closed. Like what previously the trials were, surgically ligated versus pura na rahega baas, na bajegi basuri. You know, it's been closed like, uh, like that. That should be the approach. And then target not only the mortality. Again, all the trials are looking at mortality, mortality. Uh, so you have to look at all the outcomes, CLD, NEC, PVL, death and composite outcome. Then only probably we'll be able to get some answer. So with that, I'll come to an end. We discussed about, um, you know, probably precision medicine, physiological based approach, look at the clinical echo parameters, maybe biomarkers. We discussed about timing of treatment, not too early, maybe prophylactic is not good and conservative is probably not good, but somewhere in between day two, day three, early screening, pre-symptomatic based on echo, you treat them and probably ibuprofen oral uh, might be the better choice, but if not, you can start off with IV paracetamol and then go on to ibuprofen if required and consider device closure in your center. You know, encourage your cardiologist to get trained for doing device closure because it can be a game changer in babies who are sick, ventilated. You can just device close and then get the PDA out of the equation. Then you can consider steroids to extubate, etc. And then probably um, precision medicine is coming. There are a lot of biomarkers and genetic studies are coming up, which might tell you that which doctors will remain open or not. So that's something for future, but right now, uh, clinical with echo diagnosis for decision making is the way forward. 
and uh, with that i'll stop and ready to take any questions great dr kriya it was a very nice uh, presentation like you have concisely summarized the duct from the start till the end and that, that was the perfect perfect presentation of the ada and i i think so it must be very informative and very clearly shown that when to intervene how to intervene so what are the criteria to intervene we will talk in the next session and but uh, before and after you have covered it very nicely thank you very much for uh, this very nice and extensive and exclusive talk so we would encourage if people they want to ask they can please uh, write down on the chat box no questions <laughs> <laughs> everything is either very clear or <laughs> or still can be confused fine sir we are missing okay, lots of comments uh, in the chat box section sir ah is it i can't see i can see only oral acha okay illuminating talk thank you oral pcm versus iv so uh, so again trial comparing head on to this thing oral and iv both are showing same benefits but lot of time uh, you know see these babies are not on good amount of feeds so maybe uh, it might be good to give iv paracetamol because it's available readily in india so you can choose iv paracetamol so that's why ensuring drug delivery adequate dosing then iv ensures adequate dosing so if you want to give paracetamol maybe prefer iv over oral which is better so yeah iv might be better than oral so if you want to really give it but uh, in in brufen probably oral is shown to be beneficial and it is equally efficacious and iv brufen is not available in india so if you want to choose brufen it will be oral brufen only and pd and term baby is not a problem at all so pda should not be a bothered to even look at it in a term baby unless it's a ductal dependent lesion or it is like a sometime congenital rubella or some syndromic babies where pda remains open and they don't close and then they get into failure signs of ccf there there probably you should address them but these babies often don't respond to nsaids so brufen or paracetamol doesn't act on them so that that is why probably um, they end up getting ligated uh, so but yeah but routinely probably pda is not a problem pda diagnosis at 20 day in preterm so 20 day uh, yeah so it's a good question again you know so suppose you've not seen completely baby was absolutely fine and then at third week you end up having a ductus so again there i think we can talk about this more in detail uh, about the echo assessment first so again you have to see clinical and echo say so baby is in cpap and or high flow already and the ductus is present and maybe it is significant i would still watch i would not address it i will just keep an a uh, follow up in 3 days or 1 week and see if the ductus remains open because our idea is to prevent bpd but if baby is already in cpap or in air and not much bothered this ductus will eventually will close we saw that most of the ductus will eventually close and third week you don't have any benefits of ivh pulmonary hemorrhage prevention or even nec prevention is not much benefit there so what you are trying to prevent by treating at that time is bpd prevention but so so then question comes is this baby high risk for bpd and there are ppd scores or predictable uh, parameters are there online also but you know like you know if the baby is got very small very extreme preemie 26 week or 600 gram or there was a choreo and if this baby is still ventilated then probably i'll address the ductus because uh, that ductus even though baby is right now in air because of the shunting which will be happening eventually this will lead to persistence of uh, like bpd and then baby might be difficult to wean off from the um a respiratory support or they might need a little bit of oxygen later on when they get develop bpd so i would address based on the clinical criteria and hemodynamic significant criteria up to what age can preterm pda remain open if not symptomatic so as i showed in the previous slide you know uh, there is a uh, the median age is inversely proportional to the gestation so smaller the baby so between 23 to 26 weeks it can remain open for 2 to 3 months or even up to term gestation and then they got closed 
beyond term. So if it's asymptomatic, if you leave the PD alone, it can remain open. But median age was around 70 to 75 days for babies less than 26 weeks. And it is about two to three weeks for babies between 26 to 29 weeks. And beyond 30 weeks, it is about median age at about six days. So that's why, you know, uh, you have to address this problem in the smaller babies less than 30 weeks. And most of the babies between 31, 32, 34 weeks, it will close within first week. And if it doesn't close, just address it, treat it only if it's a problem. If baby is asymptomatic, leave it alone. Don't, don't worry about it. So, uh, so echo recommendation, uh, uh, basically first screening echo probably should be done within first three days. Um, uh, if not first day, at least second or third day, try to do a screening echo. You know, may not decide to treat uh, at the time, but it's good to do screening echo, rule out structural RDCs, see how the PDA is transitioning and then do a follow-up echo. Then you know that whether PDA has become bigger or smaller compared to the previous echo whether pulmonary pressures have evolved, uh, settled, then only you decide to treat. And once you decide to commit to treat, maybe every three days is something important. So you do first echo baseline, after three days you repeat. And if the ductus is getting smaller, you continue another three days, make sure the ductus closes completely. And then uh, you uh, follow up after uh, next three days, so after six days, so zero, three and six. So every three days probably you can uh, look at it, especially if you have a bedside echo, available, uh, uh, you guys are trained. Uh, you don't have to, uh, like, you know, uh, if you want to call cardiologist and if it's costing something, then probably you might decide to give a longer uh, course and then uh, uh, follow up after that. But otherwise recommendations every three days. Excellent presentation, Gavsan. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments which I'm not able to see? Uh, no, sir, it's quite visible oh, to everyone, sir. Perfect. The participants okay. are uh, chatting to everyone. Achha. Okay, everyone. Perfect. So, Mohit, sir, and Deepen, sir, a uh, few words from you, sir. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, so, sir. Kiran Mora, sir, it is extremely uh, concise and comprehensive lecture, sir. And I think it has not only included some eco features, but all around view of clinical symptomatology of PDA has been discussed with clinical trials also. So it was a really a comprehensive and great lecture. I thank you, Kiran Mohre sir and Mohit Sani sir for this important lecture. I request Ritu Panna to deliver the yes, certificate sir. Yes, sir, for please. our presenters. Yes. So on behalf of uh, NNF Gujarat and all the respected faculties of uh, the organization, I proudly present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Kiran More for being an expert in this event today. And next we have a certificate of appre appreciation to be presented doc to Dr. Mohit Sahani for being an expert in new uh, neonatal Patshala POCA Series 5 PDA, everything but ego of NNF Gujarat State Chapter on this date. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you again for the kind oh. invitation. Thank you. Okay. We can close now. Okay. So, sir, thank you for sharing uh, for some such valuable insights in this today's session. And we are really uh, grateful for choosing us. And uh, I am grateful for this opportunity to host the session today here. With all due permissions, then I'm closing the session today and looking forward to hosting you again very soon. Till then, stay safe and healthy, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you again, once again, all the doctors.